The town of Cobalt lies 100 kilometers northeast of Sudbury in northern Ontario. In 1903, silver was discovered in the area, causing a booming mining industry to spring up almost overnight. The silver ore contained large amounts of cobalt, giving the town its name. Incorporated in 1906, by 1909 cobalt's population had soared to more than 10,000, and by 1911 it was the fourth largest silver producer in the world, the 34 surrounding mines producing 30 million ounces of silver per year, nearly 9% of the global supply. At first, excavation was done mostly by hand, but as the mines extended deeper into the ground, the need grew for increased mechanization. At first, a coal-fired plant was constructed to generate electricity and compressed air for lights, hoists, and rock drills, but this soon proved exorbitantly expensive to operate. The plant consumed some 100,000 tons of coal per year, which at $5.50 a ton meant that one drill operating 18 hours per day could cost up to $250 per month, far more than a typical miner's salary. Thankfully, a more economical source of power was close at hand, the nearby Montreal River, which featured numerous rapids ideal for generating hydroelectricity. In 1906, brothers C.A. and B.C. Bede formed the Cobalt Power Company Limited and obtained a lease to build a hydroelectric dam at Hound Chute Falls, approximately 10 kilometers from Cobalt. Due to uncertainties regarding the stability of the silver market, the project was delayed several years, construction finally beginning in 1908 and the plant opening in 1910 with a generating capacity of 3.5 megawatts. Another generating unit was added in 1911, increasing its capacity to 9.5 megawatts. Though the plant still operates to this day, soon after its construction it was supplanted in its intended role by a far more elegant and ingenious piece of engineering, the Ragged Chute Compressed Air Plant. In 1895, New Brunswick-born engineer Charles Taylor was working on the construction of the Buckingham Dam near Ottawa when he noticed an unusual phenomenon. During the winter, water flowing over the dam spillway carried air bubbles under the ice, where they rose and collected to form large ice domes. When Taylor drilled into one of these domes, he discovered that the air inside was under pressure. Taylor reasoned that the air was being compressed by the weight of the water column as it was carried beneath the surface, and realized that if water could be diverted down a long vertical shaft, this process could be harnessed to generate a reliable source of compressed air. Using scale models, he began tinkering with variations in shaft depth and diameter to achieve optimum performance. Unknown to Taylor, he had independently reinvented a much older device known as a tomp. Invented in Italy in the 17th century, tomps were most famously used by Catalonian ironworkers as a form of continuous bellows to stoke their smelting furnaces. But Taylor planned to employ the principle on a far larger scale than had previously been attempted. Taylor's first large-scale compressed air plant was built at Magog, Quebec, 100 kilometers east of Montreal, to power the Dominion Cotton Mills Company's printing works. The factory had previously experimented with various combinations of steam, electric, and compressed air power to operate its printing presses, but none proved satisfactory. Taylor's 115-kilowatt hydraulic plant, which produced compressed air at 350 kilopascals, first opened on August 12, 1896, and was an immediate success operating almost continuously until 1953. In 1898, Taylor formed the Kootenay Air Supply Company and built a 450-kilowatt compressor at Ainsworth, British Columbia, to supply the Caslow Mining Company's planned copper mine. However, the Great Northern Railroad did not build its promised spur line to the site, and the mine never opened, setting Taylor back some $60,000. But Taylor's greatest success would be at Ragged Chute, seven kilometers downstream of the Hound Chute Dam, which he first visited in 1905. Taylor promised local mine owners a plant which could provide a continuous supply of 862 kilopascal air and require almost no maintenance or manpower to operate. Many dismissed his proposal as impossible, with one mine owner describing Taylor as a crazy, two-bit so-called engineer, self-taught, little better than a mechanic, with a bunch of wacky ideas. Nonetheless, Taylor eventually managed to secure the needed funds, and construction was completed in 1910. The Ragged Chute Compressed Air Plant is a marvel of simplicity and rugged engineering. A 200-meter wide, 20-meter high dam diverts water into a set of intake heads, the height of which can be adjusted to maintain a constant head of around 46 centimeters. Through the intake heads, the water flows through a restriction into a vertical shaft 106 meters deep and 3 meters in diameter. This restriction lowers the pressure of the water via the Venturi effect, 
causing air to be drawn down inlet pipes and become entrained in the falling water column. As the bubbles are swept downwards, the air becomes compressed to a degree proportional to the height, or head, of the hydraulic column. Efficient operation required the shaft to be as smooth and perfectly cylindrical as possible, so Taylor designed a special circular drilling platform on which the excavator stood, and patched any irregularities in the stone using concrete. At the bottom of the shaft, the water stream hits a concrete cone sheathed in steel, which separates the now compressed air from the water. The air rises and is carried along the roof of a 311 meter long horizontal tunnel until it reaches an inclined plenum or collection shaft. From here, the air is carried via a 60 centimeter diameter shaft to a valve house and then along a 52 centimeter outlet pipeline for distribution to the various mines in the area. Meanwhile, the water is returned to the river through a 90 meter high tail shaft. In the event production capacity exceeds demand, the plant is designed with an automatic pressure relief system. A blowout pipe extends into the horizontal tunnel down to a critical water level, such that if the pressure increases and the water drops below this level, air is allowed to vent to the surface, creating a spectacular 60 meter high geyser that was a major tourist attraction in the area. Having no moving parts, the ragged chute plant required essentially no maintenance or intervention except to occasionally adjust the height of the feed heads, and consequently cost almost nothing to operate. Furthermore, the plant operated an astounding 82% efficiency and generated compressed air that was far cleaner and drier than from mechanical compressors, greatly improving the longevity of rock drills and other pneumatic tools. This was because the temperature of the river water was below the dew point of the air, causing nearly all the moisture to condense out before the air reached the outlet pipe. Since its completion in 1910, Ragged Chute operated almost continuously for 70 years, only being briefly shut down in 1950 and 1961 for maintenance on the intake pipes. However, by then the fortunes of the town the plant was built to serve had long since declined. By the 1930s, the silver reserves around cobalt were largely depleted and mine after mine began to close, the town steadily dwindling to its current population of around 1,200 people. The last mine in the area, Agnico Eagle, closed in the 1980s, having produced over 420 million ounces of silver. The Ragged Chute plant was acquired by Ontario Hydro in the 1960s and continued to operate until the valve house burned down in the 1980s. Yet the legacy of Ragged Chute lives on. In 2019, the Canadian federal government announced plans to construct an updated version of Taylor's hydraulic compressor to supply compressed air to the Holloway Gold Mine in northern Ontario. The compressor, designed by Sudbury-based company Electral Innovation, promises to reduce the mine's energy consumption by 40% vindicating the efficiency and utility of this nearly 400-year-old technology. As an aside, in the 1930s, the Tennessee Valley Authority attempted to build a 35-megawatt compressed air plant based on Taylor's design. However, one of the designers misread a critical measurement by a single decimal point and caused the plant's efficiency to plummet from 82% to only 10%, a testament to the astounding exactness of Taylor's calculations. Thank you for watching and see you next time on Our Own Devices.